Friday, and welcome to the Friday episode of the Dog and Bandits. I'm Orrin Phillips, and before we start, remember, Ithacon is coming up April 27th and 28th. Go to Ithacon.org, get your tickets today, and I hope to see you there. So, who's on the slate today is Mark Maddox. Mark is a phenomenal artist. He's done a number of comic books, uh, mainly comic book covers, uh, the Kolchak comic books that have come out, uh, other, other independent works. He also does movie posters, DVD uh, art. He's a phenomenal artist and just an all-around cool guy. A uh, big Universal Monsters fan. And for those who are into horror and know the horror community, uh, Mark is a multiple-time Rondo Award winner, and that is a, not an easy feat to do. Uh, I love talking to Mark because he's just like me. He's just like all of us. We love comics, we love horror, and he does it all together. So without further ado, Mr. Mark Maddox. Mark Maddox, sir, how are you? Good. I'm doing very, very good. Thank you, sir. So first question for you is, how did you first start your comics journey? How did you first discover comics? Um. It was there was probably a little bit of it even before I was old enough to understand what it was. Uh, we were my dad was Air Force and we lived over at Tyndall Air Force Base, Panama City, Florida. And my brother, who was five years older than me, was kind of my gateway drug to everything. Uh, actually, not drugs, but uh, the gateway drug to uh, television, movies, and comic books, and um we had um, some particular issues that we were really in love with Marvel's collector's item classics mm -hmm. because it was, you know, all that stuff bunched in together and they'd only been published what, like maybe five years earlier and they were reprinting them. But to a little kid that was, you know, centuries <laughs> in between, but, and we still have this one issue um, which has got uh, the planet X the uh basically kind of the fantastic four story where they sort of semi rip off uh um uh the day the earth stood still and the incredible shrinking man kind of combined mm -hmm. into one pretty cool story though but i we had that kind of stuff for a while and then we moved to my dad got shipped off to vietnam in the uh very early 70s and we moved to my mother's town and i didn't get to do a lot of stuff television was still there we had cable we had monster movies we had cartoons saturday morning cartoons uh, which blew me away when we came back from germany i had never seen anything so cool uh fantastic four uh the original fantastic four cartoons spider-man the herculoids johnny quest which i still consider one of the greatest mm -hmm. cartoons ever and but i was kind of not the happiest kid and i was looking for something you know, I, I wasn't a, a, a baseball guy. I wasn't a football guy. I collected the baseball cards just because it was something fun to do. But I found myself not really gravitating towards that. And then this next door neighbor kid, his uncle handed him a stack of comics and it reinvigorated me in that stuff. And and my brother, too, who was older, and he was about in the same boat I was. We weren't happy living there. Our dad wasn't with us, you know, and everything. And But we would walk to the store, which was miles away This in the mountains we in, in outside of Cumberland. We would walk to this place called Van Meters, and instead of going and buying a comic book or two, my brother took all of his golf caddy money and just would come home with basically everything in the store and come back with it. And so everything was re in, it, we were reintroduced to uh, Jack Kirby, uh, the Monster Comics, or the Fantastic Four. Uh, um, you know, DC uh, with their, I, I liked as a collector, collectors would be rolling their eyes. We always went for the ones that were reprints that were like collections, like DC would do an 80 page special or a hundred page special. And we ate that stuff up because it might not have been in, in the long run, wasn't as much of a collectible, but you got a lot of entertainment out of it. And uh, Marvel's greatest comics, especially when they were doing that, anything with the Hulk, especially at the time when Trimpy was uh, being uh, inked by Severin. Mm -hmm. I love that stuff. It, it's just I'm like a pig in slop with that sort of stuff. So those were the guys, especially Kirby was and he's a gateway drug for a lot of artists to begin drawing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of 
was the beginning where I, I, I kind of get what this guy's doing. I think that's what it was for a lot of us. We look, I get the way he's constructing the hand or the head or, or whatever. And he, it was the beginning of that, you know? So anyway, so that was kind of the, my, my getting back into, into comics and, and loving them. And so how does that lead to you trying to pursue or pursuing a career in illustration? Well, I, my first art hero was Dr. Seuss okay. and my second art hero was Jack Kirby. And I found myself not sure what I wanted to do yet, but a few years later we moved uh, to North Carolina. My dad was back home mm -hmm. and we moved to the base there. And some of the kids and I, we, we were, were picking up comic books and stuff. And then we kind of started egging each other on mm -hmm. with drawing we would literally sit around the dining room table at my house or at one of their houses with the absolute worst stuff to draw on. I mean, uh, like typewriter paper with, um, with, uh, I don't know if you're, if you remember those erasers that were, had the big gray circle and then the brush on the end for t erasing that, that was, Oh, that's gotta be the highest quality. <laughs> you know, you, you sit there and scrub on it and just rip a hole right through the paper. Oh my God, my planet of the apes. I just ruined it. <laughs> and, you know, and so, um, we started egging each other on, but there was a, every person would have a little bit of information they'd bring to the table um about the uh, anatomy construction of people construction of faces and we were just kids just kind of you know running into the walls and stuff just but from the time that we started within that i don't know year or two that we were hanging out before once again military ships you different places um we we had you know we'd gotten a little bit better and then i started uh drawing from like uh, I just started drawing pictures of animals and photography and then monster magazine stuff. And then around 75, we moved here to Tallahassee and, um, and I got involved heavily in Star Trek fandom, the old, the old mailing manila envelope fanzine, Star Trek, mm -hmm. you know, there wasn't all the stuff you can buy the 2 billion items you can buy nowadays kind of stuff back when it was, you know, it was a real cult following. And, um, so I started drawing a lot more people from that. I started drawing the characters off the show and everything, and then stuff from movies and whatever, Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea, Towering Inferno, The Six Million Dollar Man. I would just draw this stuff because I loved it. And uh, what happened is back, back in Carolina, I had drawn from the cover of Jimmy Olsen. It was a Jack Kirby pencils, but a Neil Adams inks of, from a, 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 an issue called The Big Boom. And it was used in a lot of their advertising for months. There was that Superman's got his one hand out and he's holding like the edge of this piece of machinery, but he's flying towards. And I sat there and I, I looked at it and I drew it and uh, you know, I, I didn't think anything of it. You know, I knew what I was trying to do, but then I showed it to my dad and he lost his mind. I mean, he was like, you drew this, you, drew, you drew this. I said, yeah, I drew it from this come. And he loved it. And my dad, who, had worked in the oil fields uh, and during the depression at the age of 13, had his own apartment at the age of 13 because his mom couldn't afford to, 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 to take care of him. Yeah. He saw that one of his kids was going to probably do something more than just be a regular day laborer or putting, pushing pencils in an office. Mm -hmm. And he always kind of nudged me towards, okay, go to the art classes in high school. And then as soon as I got out of high school, I was going to goof off. I, you know, locked my fingers back my head, my head, put up, put on the television stuff set and started watching wild, wild west. And he walks in, he goes, no, 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 no. He goes, there's an art school over here at the tech school. That's where you're going. Mm -hmm. And then you'll go to, you'll go to college after that. I begrudgingly went to the art class. He couldn't get me out of it. Once we started, I loved it. My teacher was a huge, he was an old, old, uh, 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 an older guy who um, his favorite his favorite comic strip of all time was uh, Terry and the Pirates, and he actually had done oddly enough he was one of the first guys, the first seven guys that set up the base at Panama City where I would later be born, 
and he and he also did stuff like he did the machine gun uh, manuals and stuff like people like Jimmy Stewart used when they were going into the war. Mm -hmm. That was all his stuff. He was the artist of that base. He did the newspaper. He did the signage. He did the the technical manuals. He was an excellent artist. And I my, my dad goes, okay, you're going to do this for this three months. Then you're going to go to college. And then when if you want to, you can come back and finish it. He couldn't get me out of there. It was like, you know, I was hanging on, you know, by my, by, and so I went to college halftime and then to this school. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very professional, old school style illustration. It was, it was commercial art, but he loved the illustration aspects and he was a great illustrator. Mm -hmm. So I always did that. And then later, Went to college, went to FSU uh, uh, later, and I was reading an article by Boris where he recommended anybody who wanted to become a painting illustrator should go to their local university and see if they've got painting classes. So I took painting classes at FSU. I took uh, some classes with uh, – it was just a a, a a a thing where you paid like 25 bucks and you got to get taught by Kelly Freeze, um, who did the uh, News of the World uh, – uh, Queen album cover, but he had also done a lot of fantasy and science fiction stuff, weird tales and amazing stories. And he did that stuff for decades. He was one of the creators of like the Mad Magazine kid too. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I learned more from him in hours than I learned at FSU in like months, but I gobbled up everything he said. So anyway, that's, uh, you know, and then I started getting jobs. I did some jobs. I had some illustration jobs at t-shirt companies and stuff. And then, but I needed to make more money. So I ended up going, working for a printing company for years. But then somebody goes, you know, Maddox is, they were looking for an artist thing of Maddox is this, you know, he's, he's got, he's got some skill. Mm -hmm. And before it was over, before I left that company, I was a corporate art director and it was a big company, Homes and Land Publishing Corp. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was really nice. Um, so then um, 2008 happened. And the housing bubble burst and people like me, dime a dozen, the money that I was making, nobody was going to give it to. I'd actually go for a job interview and make the guy, the guy who was, um, who was interviewing me got mad when I told him what I thought my, what, where my salary should be. And he goes, that's almost double what I make. And I said, and I told him, I said, and I don't know, you might have to bleep this. I said, well, then you're being screwed. Right. He like at big giant professional companies, they were paying like hardly anything anymore for artists so i got mad which mm -hmm. is sometimes a good thing and i had already already wanted to be a book illustrator and a magazine illustrator and started pushing it pushing it and pushing it and pushing it and it uh kind of started i actually started doing some comic work very little inking and a few comic pages but man comic books it's like mike waringo said comics are hard <laughs> comics comic composition is hard especially when you approach it from an illustrator's point of view where everything every panel is its own painting and it gave me a lot of respect for the guys who really knew how to do great layout of pages and um i, I you know but i i liked doing it it was fun doing it for a little while but then i said eh, i just want to do like one image i want to do the cover <laughs> Right. <laughs> that's what that's what I want to do. So I started doing different stuff like books and uh, 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 what they call new pulp and then monster magazines and stuff like that. And slowly got to where I've got this day business where that's that's what I do. You know, just day business of science fiction, fantasy, every once in a while, beautiful women, this, that or the other spies or whatever. So I'm sorry, I'm talking my head off. I don't know. I, it, it's very interesting. And I, and I want to go back to something you said, because you you know, when you talk about inking, that you looked at the panels to sort of a different lens than somebody who was, you know, brought up in comics, doing comic art. Could you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about the differences that you saw as opposed to somebody who, you know, just went was an inker professionally? Well, they're, they're great, great artists that I look at and I just am blown away by their inking, their crosshatching. Um, uh, like I said, back to, back to Severin. And his and his it's amazing to me that you look at the Hulk the way Trimpy drew it, but then he would sculpt the Hulk mm -hmm. with all those micro lines, all the stuff that the guys did back at EC, uh, Jack Davis's inking. Uh, so there were guys that were really good, but the thing that threw me off is most of the guys that I studied were people like Franklin Booth. 
mm -hmm. uh, who was the big inspiration for Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein book. He was the he was the guy that he uh, the the story as I know it. He was his stupidity made him a great pen and ink guy. He thought that um i forget uh, what's the term with like money it's not it's not inked it's 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 um a plate mm -hmm. you etch you etch it he thought etching was inking so he learned to draw like etching which is it looks real beautiful with not as much effort but he learned to draw that and he was like a farm boy out out west mm -hmm. and uh so to me he was one of the great he is probably the greatest pen and ink artist of all time. People like Virgil Finlay and their insanity. And just recently I was at a friend's house who owns some original Virgil Finlay's. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Oh, this, this is even wilder to see in real life. Cause you thought black and white ink, you know, other than maybe a coffee stain or something up in the corner, it's going to be photographed and then reduce some. And you'll, you'll look at the, the, the large size and you go, yeah, okay. I, I can see it being done. No, his stuff was actual size and perfect. It was insane that all the science fiction artwork and horror artwork that he did. And it was one of those, you know, we're not worthy moments, you know. Um, so I'm looking at that and I want to try to apply it to comics, but you can't, you don't have that kind of time. Right. And that was like, well, Mark, do you want to do comics with, you know, uh, operating at half of what you know? Or do you want to illustrate and just throw the kitchen sink and everything at the illustrations you're doing? And I, I chose that, right. but I still have massive respect for, for comic book guys. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I'll always be grateful to it too, for um, the decades that they, you know, put a smile on my face, you know, and they always come back, you know, the eighties, I kind of got out of it in the seventies, the late seventies. And then the eighties hit. And then because hey, you begin to go back and look at comic books and I come back in and go, Holy crap, this stuff is amazing what these guys are doing now. So it's almost like an oscilloscope, you know, good, bad, good, bad, good, bad over the decades, you know, because <laughs> you, I know you like horror and I want to talk horror covers for a second. What do you prefer? Is it, sort of uh, maybe what DC or Gold Key was doing with more of a startling image of a ghost, something like that, or an EC version, which would be more gore, more shock value as far as horror goes. Uh, boy, that's a, um, I, I, I remember stuff like, what was the, 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 what's the witches, the DC witches. I didn't, pay as much attention to to those that were like in the in the 70s i unfortunately had to play catch up like a lot of us did with ec when they started reprinting mm -hmm. the only thing i ever knew of ec was pictures i saw in the back of famous monsters that you could order reprints and it wasn't until russ cochran started coming out with those hardback editions of the ec stuff that i got a chance to look at it and was completely blown away i mean every artist was a genius every it was like they hired the best the best stories the best writing um when it comes to uh gore or anything like that i mean yeah there were some of those ecs like what's the one where the kids grinding up the parents at the end and you see the meat coming out the end of the yeah. meat grinder i guess you'd call that gross <laughs> But um, I don't know. It just depends. I mean, some people get away with gore or horrific imagery, and some people don't. It's like The Exorcist is a, is a great movie that does have very intense and graphic moments, but it's still a great movie, whereas some movies have no gore in them all at all, and yet you're completely terrified, like The Sixth Sense or go even going even further back, Night of the Demon slash Curse of the Demon, depending on what country you're in. Mm -hmm great movies and and comics and stories like that i just want that it can be gory but the story's got to warrant it it can't just be hey we're gonna make a real gory graphic thing and that'll fill in for the fact that we don't really know what the hell we're doing you know <laughs> we're not we're not great at character development or something like that does that well, make any sense oh 100 100 percent and I know yeah. one thing, some of the stuff that you created are things that I love so much, which is the universal monsters and the way you mm -hmm. draw them, you could tell there's a lot of love and respect that goes in to doing that. Uh, how did that love affair begin with, with the universal monsters? 
Um, we, we, around the house, even in Germany, we had uh, issues of famous monsters. And my mother, one time, she was like, it was close to Christmas. And she goes, okay, we're in the bookstore here. You're going to go over there and you're going to buy that magazine. She gave me a dollar. She goes, you're going to go over and you're going to buy that magazine for your brother. You're going to wrap it up and you're going to give it to him for Christmas. So I walked over and it was a copy of Famous Monsters. I think it was like 46 or something like that. And mm-hmm. On the cover was something I'd never seen before, Frankenstein fighting the Wolfman. And I lost it. I actually almost threw a temper tantrum in the store because she was like, no, no, that's for your brother. I, no, I want it. I want it. Don't you understand? And she goes, and she goes, look, she goes, I'll tell you what, next time we're here in the store, the next one of that magazine that comes out, I'll buy you one. Mm-hmm. But that's for your brother. So he got it. Years later, I bought a bought a a, a a copy in near Mint down in Orlando. So I finally got it, but I was like forty years old. <laughs> it only took it only took like twenty six years. No, actually longer than that. I was like six years old when I saw it. Thirty six, whatever. Anyway, thirty five years or something. But um, and it was by Ron Cobb, who would later go on and do designs for like Alien and 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 stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But that was the beginning and then but there was things that were really huge at the time gold key had just put out a a huge comic book on king kong Mm -hmm. around 68 69 uh and because king kong was out and about more you were seeing it on television and the and the rankin and bass had had worked were working with the japanese and doing some king kong movies corny still but i still love them even in their rubber suit way (laughs) i I still love that 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 movie and then there was the king kong cartoon but I didn't see, it was like King Kong. And when we moved and settled in, in the United States, what shocked me is one Saturday morning television, two color television and three, how many monster movies there were. And, uh, the, the, you know, I, I, I kind of actually started with, uh, some of the hammer, a few of the hammer films first, like evil of Frankenstein and stuff mm-hmm. and Godzilla and creature from the black lagoon. I saw those first on science fiction theater, like at noon on Saturday, mm-hmm. uh, from, I think it was out of Denver. We were living it right outside of rapid city, South Dakota, but the, um, uh, uh, but then one night they did a, um, uh, a thing where they had, uh, it was going to be a double feature on Friday night, it was Frankenstein and the Bride of Frankenstein. And I was like, holy crap. <laughs> this is the mother load. I've been waiting to see it. And I saw him. I sat there and I watched both of them. I absolutely loved them and very high quality. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hollywood, uh, the Hollywood machine in full swing, but working on monsters. It wasn't Fred and Ginger. It wasn't Gone with the Wind. It was what what universal did best was monster movies right. and uh they're great uh, i saw king kong about that same year i saw george powell's the time machine war of the worlds came on national television the george powell version mm-hmm. there was all this stuff and it was just like filling my head right. it just filled up my head and kind of created the weird creature you're talking to right now <laughs> you know I, I want to tell you, you mentioned before you prefer doing covers. Um, when you're working on a cover, uh, two questions, really. How much information are you given about the book to to create for the cover? And what's usually the the time frame as to get it done? Um, it depends. I've got some guys that are actually writing fiction here and there, and they'll send me the idea or we'll talk on the phone uh, batting things back and forth and all that. That is almost a lot of times it's either they they tell me the basic idea of the story and then we think of a a cover together or they've already got an idea and then they tell me um a lot of that is uh you know uh you know eventually i give them like a a, like a sketch or two that they look at and and okay that works or can we do this but can we make these changes um then there's the easy ones for most people that is with the movie stuff it's like either give me a copy of the film if I don't already own it, which there's a good chance I do, or I'll find a copy of it. I'll watch the film multiple times and then pull the nutrients out of it that I think affected me the most and see if I can make a cover from it. Gotcha. Be- um, and so that, that there's two different things. Um, some covers, I'd say a lot of covers, we we work on a time frame. Some people don't need stuff. It's like, well, it's going to be, this is like January. I've got people now that I'm talking on the phone this week 
three or four people. It's like stuff is needed in June, July, August. So I just start racking them up in the queue. Um, but with things like movie covers, the actual time it takes once I've gotten started, an easy one can be maybe maybe a very easy one could be like five days uh i've had a i've had some of them though take as much as a month to 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 six weeks wow. where i'm just like and i know that by that point i'm getting underpaid for what i'm doing but i'm like no this has got to be right this has got to be i'm doing it for the client but i'm doing it for myself too mm-hmm. and uh, so yeah, I mean, um, but a lot of a lot of them on average, I'd say, is eh, about two weeks for, okay. for 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 a bunch of them. But every once in a while, like that Godzilla versus Ghidra one that I did, it was like, man, if I saw another scale, I was seeing painting scales. I was painting them in my dreams. <laughs> I mean, there's certain ones that just you just are going and going and going and going, and it's like, you know, please kill me, you know, <laughs> but. <laughs> you you also worked on a uh, comics and it's based on a show that I'm I'm linked to the game on I've gotten into because I've seen a couple of the movies on Sven Gulli I watched some of the other episodes and that's Kolchak. Uh how did you get involved with Kolchak and were you a fan of the show? Oh, I was there the first night. The first night. I don't know. I I'm 62. I don't know how old you are. It's it, you know 46. You're, okay, so you're you're a little kid. You're a toddler. Yeah. <laughs> so, so are you, aren't you up late for you know? No. I know. I'm, but, I'm uh, trying to get tuckered out here. It was it would cold check. Um, what got it going in um, in I think it was seventy two. I don't want to say February seventy two. Somebody said it was January seventy two, but I thought it was February. Anyway, um, one night on the, the, the there was these movies made for television, and they had this preview. Uh, ABC would do these movies of the week and they started showing this preview for this guy who was saying, you know, these women have been killed and it seems like he's, they've been killed by this guy. And the, and the big line was this nut thinks he's a vampire. He's killed four, maybe five women. And I'm quoting exact. And they kept playing that, that commercial. Now I didn't, I knew it was affecting me. What I did not know was it was affecting the rest of the country. It was the highest rated television movie up to that point of all time it was made and and i was um i was like oh man i I gotta watch out and find out if this guy's a vampire because i was gonna be really mad if he was just a nut (laughs) i was gonna be like oh he's just a psycho and he's just you know he's lost oh and it didn't disappoint no you know it turned out to be the real deal the the vampire was great, great action sequences, you know, cops just shooting at him and nothing's happening, throwing mm-hmm. guys out of second and third story windows and all that. And a great fight at the end. And um, and in the bright lights of Las Vegas, that was the weird thing. I, 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 I've i had people argue with me before. Well, there have been other vampire films that took place in present day, like Dracula. Uh, there's a Dracula night. What was it called? Dracula 57 or something. It was um, an American film mm-hmm. and it takes place in modern times, but it's like, it's in, just in a house. And then there's like a cave and it's, it is, it is modern times, but it's really not. It's got all the trappings of the Gothic. Mm-hmm. And then somebody said, well, dark shadows takes place in modern times. And I said, it does. But how often on dark shadows did you see them with the TV set in the room? Or how often, I mean, they used cars here and there, and they did have a telephone, but it might as well have been, you know, 200 years earlier. <laughs> and, and But the Night Stalker was bright, glitzy, and vibrant, and and uh, and uh, a little seedy, too. And and the lead guy, you, you, he, he was the hero by the end of the film. He was, he was a little seedy. He was a little goofy. And so I loved it. Second film came on, watched it. Then a TV show comes on a few years later, loved it. Although there are some bad episodes. There are some episodes that that's the monster. <laughs> I swore if I ever, you, you know, the episodes at all, you know, which I, the, the one with the headless motorcycle. I was guy. about to bring that up. I was going to say the guy, which oddly, 
Well, yeah. Well, but the giant. I said. I said if I ever have to, if anybody ever has me do a a a, a the chopper guy on a cover or anything like that, I am going to shrink those shoulders down. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> which oddly enough, if I remember correctly, I think was that I think that episode was uh, uh, was, it, was it written by Bob Zemeckis, oh, who man. did who later did Forrest Gump and Roger Rabbit and and all these you know Academy Award films, yeah. and you know here he done doing Chopper, you know. <laughs> um, actually, the story's not bad in that one. All it's just the execution of the monsters horrible, and there's a few other episodes where you're where you're disappointed. The Trevi collection and all that, but yeah. some of them like the Ripper, the Zombie was excellent. Yeah um i you know the invisible monster but then of course that's kind of a cheat but you know he looked great and uh <laughs> and some other ones i love the i when i was younger i didn't like the lady vampire but i really my 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 I, my thoughts have changed quite a bit on that i love it when she's throwing football players all over the all over the living room and throwing <laughs> them out the windows and stuff um so yeah i mean i i i, I did that and i um I'm trying to remember the first thing that I did. I mean, uh, aside from fan art and stuff, but um, I think I heard Moonstone was doing something with the Night Stalker mm -hmm. and I showed him my portfolio and I got to do the first comic book, uh, Kolchak, the Night Stalker Files. I got to do the cover of that. And then later they started uh, publishing um, uh, just fiction books mm -hmm. and I got to do those. And I'm hoping that here in the near future, there'll be a, an actual history of Kolchak book that I'm working on the, the, all the way from the first film, all the way through even the, right. uh, the 1990s um, or there was a 1990s or 2000s, that little Kolchak show that lasted about five minutes. Mm -hmm um so yeah i mean um but i loved it i loved the characters i uh, it was it was it was it was it, i don't know how you'd say it it was sort of like it was it was as exciting to me as the universal monsters were in a lot of ways gotcha. but the but the but the bright light not the bright light of day but the bright light of lights of vegas and chicago and all that kind of stuff made it just it, it but but they they respected it you know i thought it was pretty cool Big fan. And another uh, character that you worked on is one that's it's had a long lineage, and that's the Heap. Uh, it just keep, a character that keeps coming back and coming back here and there. Um, how were you pitched it, and what did you want to bring to the character? Well, um, I, I, I knew that they were bringing it back, and that they were going to make some changes. I knew what my version of the heap was in my head the old just you know just a grass monster and in this one they had uh put like i can't remember it's, it's i'm amazed you actually brought this up because i thought nobody brings it up <laughs> uh i don't even know if i've ever been asked about it once ever but i mean i'm proud of the cover that he did but i'm not i wasn't happy with the fact that it wasn't the heap as originally envisioned they had put like a roman helmet on him mm -hmm. and there was like foliage and stuff coming out i'm still proud of my rendering of him but i thought you know people would look at me and go hey you know you're kind of a traitor you sort of just tried to had to put your 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 stamp on it didn't you it's like no 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 i was told what i was going to do i was yeah. i i was given my marching orders and I, I, I did it, but, um, you know, it's one of those things where not everything you do is going to float your boat. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you are also the recipient of a Rondo award mm -hmm. uh, that had to be the thrill of a lifetime. Yeah. I've won it seven times. Yeah. <laughs> seven, seven times. And it means a lot to me. Um, uh, it's for classic horror films, you know, I mean, they also deal with stuff like when you vote there, they still throw in stuff like the Marvel of Marvel Avengers movies get thrown in there too, as, right. as fantasy and all that kind of stuff. Uh, uh, but a lot of it deals with, uh, you know, stuff that's, well, I mean, they deal with stuff with the exorcist and alien mm -hmm. and all that too, but a lot of it's before that, uh, just keeping the old, the old stuff alive. Um, I'm very proud of that. Uh, I, I, I am always shocked that I win. I I'm proud of it. It's, you know, one of the things I really, you know, it, 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 it gives me a deep sense of pride, you know? What is it about 
these classic horror and and horror in general that just keeps bringing people in and in and in because I, I know with the like we said before the universal monsters there's a strong army young people older people who just mm -hmm. absolutely go bananas for it and i know your art uh they they absolutely love it as much too i think that it was like the first time the only, the way i think of it is when i was a kid some of, and I was watching the, the Universal Monster movies weren't that old. I think they were only like, it was like 1931, 41, 51, 61. They were only for like 40 years old when I started watching them, which, you know, I mean, Star Wars isn't, isn't Star Wars almost 40 years old now? Isn't it older? More than that. Yeah. That's all 50. Yeah. Years. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and, and, and so I looked at it at the time is that it, it in terms of that, it's, it, it was actually still kind of almost not, not new, but newer. And now it's coming up, well, you know, pretty soon we'll get that 100th anniversary of Dracula and Frankenstein, which not only makes the film seem old, it makes me seem old, <laughs> makes me feel old. But I remember the first time I ever watched Cabinet of Dr. Caligari or or Nosferatu, and I was, I was like, these are so cool. And they're so different. I don't, I, Nosferatu might have been the, well, uh, other than home movies, <laughs> the first silent film I ever watched. <laughs> and I, I loved it. And I loved Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and I was happy to. And then I saw Metropolis and I loved that. And so for me, that was almost like, yes. And a lot of people still love Nosferatu. Kids have got Nosferatu on their t shirts. And that's, that's now, I mean, uh, 19, is it 1925? Is that what it is? Yeah, I mean, that, that means in, in, a, in, a, in a year or two. No, Nosferatu is over 100 because I did, the, an idiot, I did the cover for Scream about this 100th anniversary. <laughs> Never mind, brain fart. <laughs> anyway, uh, so it's 100 years old and, and, and yet the people still love it. People still love Metropolis. I mean, it still keep, it gets coming, you know, keeps being brought back in some way. Mm -hmm. So the same thing with the Universal Monster movies. I mean, a guy with a flat head, a a, a wolf man, a, a you know, a Dracula, Lugosi, uh, and his um, heavy accent, uh, which you know, at some point, at different points in time, had become laughable, mm -hmm. still has charm that people want. I mean, I, you know, one thing I wish that when Lugosi died, you know, you know, when he did, I, I wish he had known how kind of famous his name still is all these decades later, mm -hmm. you know, like 60, 70 years after his death, he still... You know, it's a little bit like the ending of the movie Ed Wood, where they say that, you know, Lugosi stuff outsells Karloff's, you know, and all that. And it, it would make him happy. Um, I I love all that stuff. Creature from the Black Lagoon, King Kong, all that. The science fiction movies of the 50s, giant insects. You know, I just eat it up. You know, it's it's fun. What's and the I'm glad. Go ahead. No, 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 please finish. Well, I, I'm just saying, I think one of the reasons that it, it's, it's happening and hasn't died the way some things has. I've watched in my lifetime certain things that were popular. Mm -hmm. um, like, well, here's here's the thing. You being a comic book collector, you'll understand this. Is that comic books are still viable and the old ones are still viable because it, they are still being brought back into the new culture. Where uh, You know, Shazam movies, the, the Avengers, Captain America from world war ii is still out there all the time people love him superman batman wonder woman but there are certain things that don't get that new infusion or that rolling infusion that you get i mean and that is like tin toys from the 1920s and 30s i've watched guys sit there with just glum looks on their faces and go all the prices that these took, you know, 30 40 years ago they're just gone they're just becoming worthless because nobody is alive that remembered it when it was important and for comic books and comic book films and new comic books in the comic book industry that it keeps things it keeps things going but um the with the universal monsters and the hammer films and the insect movies and and uh, you know day the earth is still for being is that there's always that new copy coming out on blu-ray and then 4k and then who knows what's next 8k keeps it in the public eye i mean every halloween at walmart they they 
go to the back room, dust off the Universal Monsters they didn't sell that year before and put it back out on the shelf, <laughs> and they sell like hotcakes. So, you know, I'm glad for that, but there are certain things that just sort of fade out, you mm -hmm. know, they just fade away and it's kind of sad, you know. I want to ask about your uh, technique with your art, because how do you, with, with these creatures like this and, and the characters like this, um, I know you use photographs as point of reference, but how do you decide on the correct coloration, the correct shading on certain parts? Is that your decision or do you use other reference articles to, to, to come up with that? Um, every once in a while, well, I've actually had a couple of times I've contacted historians. Uh, one of the ones I lucked out on, I was getting ready to paint the cover for a magazine, Mad Scientist. I was doing Invasion of the Saucer Men. Mm -hmm. And most people think, well, they're, they're little Martians. They're going to be green, you know, or whatever. And I said, that's, that's probably right but I'm not going to take a chance. So I went ahead and contacted a friend of mine who knew Bob Burns, who was worked a little bit on the film itself. Oh. And they, and he said, no, the color of that thing, they're not green, they're orange. And so I, you know, painted him in an orange and later got a note that was actually on a, on a horror film board where Bob Burns said, uh, this is the best representation I've ever seen on a magazine cover of the little big head guys. Wow. And, and, and I think he was alluding to the fact that somebody finally got the color, right. Although I think other people had, mm -hmm. it was that I made sure the structure of them was exactly right. And that the color was right. I try to get it as, as, as best as I can. And um, it depends. I'd say every out of every cover, somehow I managed to get it right on the color almost every time i think there might be a couple that i sort of go oh you know i just have no way to know what the color mm. is is nosferatu an off yellow is he an off blue or whatever well one thing i can be certain of nobody else knows either <laughs> you know what i'm saying unless somebody finds the nosferatu working diaries right. you know and everything like that so it's like well i i, I, I try to give it a best guess you know, and, and, and stuff. And, but most of the time, a lot of times there's either some bit of reference to color. One of them that I haven't really done that much is Karloff's Frankenstein, but I've, I've heard that um, because there was home, home movie shot mm -hmm. of him by, I don't know if it was his daughter or somebody did, but it was little eight millimeter films and they dusted them off and restored them and put them on. First time I saw him was on entertainment tonight mm -hmm. and you got to see the green, this actual green that he was and I was like, well, when I go to do a serious Frankenstein painting someday, that'll be the the color that that's what I'll be looking at for reference. You know, it's work, but bottom line, <laughs> it's labor, <laughs> you know. I say, and I'm not trying to blow smoke here, but you're so good at what you do and your, your art is so beautiful. Could you ever see yourself letting someone else do the ink or the coloring with these? Or do you need to be, you need to have the whole thing and charge yourself? Uh, you know, there's been times I've talked with other guys, uh, uh, comic book artists about maybe, you know, they do a sketch and then I finish it or vice versa. Right. Um, I could see that happening. It hasn't. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't have a problem with that. I, 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 I but I will say this, I am kind of a control freak, you know, in, in, in a world where we, we feel like we don't have much control. Right. It's one thing I, it's like, this is mine. I, I did it. I own it <laughs> and, and, and everything. But then still somebody comes along and goes, you know, there's something wrong with the eye, the left eye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or something. <laughs> and, but, but most of the time it, it, it just works out that I, I have to do it all myself, you know, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't be, uh, against i think it'd be kind of fun to 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 mix and match uh uh with, with another artist sometime it'd be kind of fun it's like it's like uh all the different guys that inked kirby mm -hmm. and then you look at them from the joe Sinat to uh chick stone but then all of a sudden you get uh you know for that captain america bicentennial battles you get a couple of pages of barry windsor smith inking jack kirby and it's beautiful right. You know, it's a great, and I know Smith was a, a, a huge Jack Kirby fan, so it was probably fun for him as well. 
but so yeah i'm not i'm not against it yeah it's just i just don't know when a situation like that would arise now 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 this is going to go out and it's going to be go. bombarded <laughs> I know, you know, you, you work on so many different things, but with the right story, the right partner, the right scenario, could you see yourself on a comic book cover interior, you know, maybe like four issues to or six issues or something like that, or you'd rather just work on certain things and, and not get into the whole mix of it? I, it, I'm not saying it could never happen. It would be, um, well, okay. I'm trying to remember the name of this magazine. I don't, you know, it was published in the early seventies and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't Warren and it wasn't Marvel. It wasn't those big, it was a black and white one when, when, when it looked like Marvel was trying to do a little bit of what Warren was doing with their Dracula comics and oh. something a little more, a little more adult, but this one was called, and I want to say, was it, was it Atlas or somebody that published it? It was called uh, Adventure Something, Thrilling Adventure. The first issue had a yellow cover with mm -hmm. artwork on the cover by er Ernie Cullen. And it was um, one thing they had inside that intrigued me was they had a, and he was on the cover too, in a, in a, in a, in a composition with a bunch of other characters on the inside. But they had Lawrence of Arabia as a comic on the inside of, of like, I think it was five stories total. Right. And I thought that would be something that would be cool. I would like, I would like to do that. Mm -hmm. That would be, that would be fun to do something like that. Now, having said it and then going back after having said, man, this kills me. <laughs> uh, I would go and, I would, I would, I would say yes to it. And then you'd find me, well, he, he threw a rope up over the rafters and hung yeah, himself yeah. At, on page three, you know, <laughs> at page three. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had done, I, I, I did enough of it. I, I could actually see myself getting better from page to page though. So I don't know, maybe, maybe if I kept pushing it, maybe I would have been a comic book artist. I don't know. I think I was warming up to it and okay. I never got beyond the warming up stage, but um but, uh, you know, it was great. Like I said, just they have, were replaying years ago, Mike Waringo interviews just just after he passed. And when he said that, he goes, man, the composition on those pages is hard. Yeah. And I was like, thank God you got to hear that from a professional, <laughs> you know, somebody you really admire. <laughs> so, what, What's a character or a movie or something that you haven't drawn yet that you're dying to get your hands on? Oh, boy. Um, I have done a tiny bit of Star Trek. I did like a toy package for the next generation. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind being involved with a cover or something. I don't care what it is. Toy packages, paperback, book covers, whatever for classic Star Trek. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's, I, um, there's a, um, there's Blu-ray and DVD covers I would like to to do covers for. I'd like to do some that aren't even fantasy, horror, science fiction. Like I wouldn't mind doing something like some old Jimmy Stewart westerns or something by Anthony Mann, or classic films or something. Mm -hmm. um, there, you know, what's funny is now you're asking me. It's sort of like, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there's a thousand answers, but now that I'm being asked, it's like I got a brain lock. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff out there. Right. And one thing I one thing I found myself kind of enjoying doing is when somebody gives me a project for a bad film, mm -hmm. like a cover for a bad horror film or what would be called a bad bi horror film by the majority of the public. Some guys would stick their nose up and you go, that is not a that is not a horror, bad horror film. That's a classic. It's like, nah, that pretty much stinks, pal. <laughs> That's a stinker. We wouldn't have we wouldn't have sat there and watched as little kids, but there's these people that love bad films mm -hmm. and i i've i i even like doing the covers for those mm -hmm. you know just somehow just watching the film multiple times and say what can i pull out of this that makes that cover makes people want to buy it who've never seen the film right. and it, it, it happens I, I i get to do that i find that to be fun and a challenge you know so i don't know i mean there's there's stuff out there uh lou ferrigno asked me one time how, how come i'd never done a picture of him i said well nobody gave me the job yet there you go. Uh, stuff like that. Um, I don't know. 
Irwin Allen, the, the Invaders television series from the 60s, UFO. Mm-hmm. I did a I did a Lindsay Wagner uh, Bionic Woman cover for Infinity Magazine that I was pretty proud of, but it was after somebody had already done the Six Million Dollar Man. I really, 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 really want to do a picture of Steve Austin running and Bigfoot chasing him with a tree. <laughs> that then I could die. Then I could just go like, I finished it. It's yeah. off to the public. <laughs> <laughs> He died smiling. But it's, yeah, really. <laughs> but um, you know, just all the stuff that I always loved as a kid. Please let me please let me give back a little bit, as I think is is my attitude, you know. Well, now I gotta ask because you just name dropped Lou Ferrigno. You have seven Rondo Awards. You had to have met some really cool people through the years. Who are some folks that you've met that you had to sort of pinch yourself and be like, oh, I'm having a conversation with this person right now? Well, I got I got to be honest with you. I I was such a bashful person for years. I actually had to kind of do self talk and get myself to where I would talk to people, and I'm still very nervous. Mm-hmm. I my friends will actually grab me when some famous actor actress shows up that I like lose my mind over, like uh, somebody from like uh, some of the ladies from uh, one of my favorite James Bond films is Thunderball Mm -hmm. and some of the ladies were there and I was like oh man I really want to meet him because that's like the film I saw when I was five and and all that and the guys will come on and they start dragging me to them because they know I'm bashful and but they know that that they're going to force me to talk to these people so I'm really bashful about actors. I don't know why. I think it might be one of the things that makes me good at drawing them and painting them is also the thing that makes me bashful. And it's like they matter to me. Right. And it's probably a very strange thing to say. Right. But but um, I did. I, I, I tell you what, the first person I, I, I was going to meet him and I saw him and I got really bashful was and this I, I could kick myself was Jack Kirby. Wow. He was there. He was at the convention. I saw him across the room. I went like, it's Jack Kirby. And then he looked up almost like he heard it. And he sort of looked across the room <laughs> over these hundreds of people and sort of just stared at me for a second. I don't think I even nodded. And then I just like looked down and I was like, I was too bashful to go talk to him. What I needed to do, and I've replayed that, that moment in my head a million times where I go to him and say, thank you for giving me a career and a life. And that, you know, I put food on the table. Yep which started with loving your work and emulating it. That's what I would have liked to have said, but I didn't, I wussed out and uh, I'm, I'm putting, you know, this is, you can, you, when you put this one up, when you post it, the the, the name of the episode, Mark Maddox is shame. <laughs> Mark Maddox, the wuss. So, but, um, and then just, uh, and they dragged, they dragged me to meet William Shatner. Okay. Uh, which was cool. I was glad, glad it happened. Uh, different people from, uh, from different movies and even people that aren't necessarily that famous to the general public, but just if they meant a lot to me, I get bashful Mm -hmm. when I see them. I'm getting better, especially when some people have really got the gift of gab. Like some of the actors are really fun. Mm -hmm. Uh, Um, so, um, people from Doctor Who, people from Star Trek, people from James Bond, people, uh, famous comic book artists. Mm-hmm. Um, one that I met that I kind of said, hi, got his autograph and then left. And later I'm like, you idiot. And I'm going to reach up here for a, <laughs> for a sample. I've got a, I've got a 9.4 or something mm-hmm. upstairs, but this is the reading copy that I, I keep here is, Gil Kane's oh. Tales to Astonish with uh, the Hulk fighting the Abomination, which mm-hmm. is one of the earliest comics my mother ever bought me, and I loved it. And I did a I did an illustration a few years ago for a guy in pen and ink, and it was um, it was uh, uh, hey, you know, he goes, I don't have a lot of money, so well, I went up on eBay. I said, just buy me buy me that comic in nine point four, mm-hmm. and. He did. So it was like, I should have been on a street corner. We'll, we'll, we'll do, we'll do artwork for comics, you know, and a sign, but stuff like that. So I saw Gil Kane and I just said, hi, and he autographed my thing. And then I left and that I'm sorry about. Yeah. Very sorry about that. And I wouldn't talk to him about all the other stuff that everybody knows him for more. I would talk to him about those Hulk issues that he did because that Hulk is got a, got a, He's still the, the 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 good guy in the stories, but he's just got this intensity to him that I, I love. You know, there's people like that. You yeah. know, people that you just 
you know, I met Will Eisner finally. I was grateful to meet Will Eisner, and I did talk to him for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> very nice. I'm a massive Spirit fan. Now, you can't see it from here, but mm -hmm. over there on thing is a giant Spirit poster hanging oh. up over my cutting table from uh, issue three of the Warren reprints where he's running from a train. Mm -hmm on the train track which which oddly enough is colored by richard corbin most people don't know that but um anyway uh you know just all that yeah i'm just a fanboy. yeah yeah for sure i, I just had to ask quickly because i'm a big james bond fan too <laughs> did you ever read mm -hmm. uh richard keel no i hadn't no i wish i had he all every time i see see pictures of him he looks like a sweetheart he's always grabbing people's head yeah you know I mean, the size of those hands and it's like, you know, but, but then you saw him with Roger Moore one time, he did the exact same thing to him too, had his, like his hand over the top and everyone's like Roger Moore's eyes are bugging out, but he always seemed like a sweetheart, but, the, but Richard Kyle had other things too. He had like uh, the twilight zone mm -hmm. and other shows and movies and stuff that he did that is like, you know, and, and, but Jaws was probably the thing that he, he, he most, most remembered for, you know, not Ega. Right. I don't know if you know that one, but it's like a caveman out in the desert in modern times. Or I don't even remember. I, I saw it once. Why does that sound very familiar? I think that was yeah. on Spotify or something like that. Or yeah. it was, like, it was on. It, it could have been. Yeah. And I was even watching an episode of Wild Wild West the other day where him and him and Robert Conrad are getting into a fight. And you can't fake his size. So there was nobody else to do the stunts. So, yeah. Robert Conrad loved to do his own stunts, mm -hmm. but who the hell's going to replace Richard Kyle for the stunt <laughs> in the scene? It's like, you know, uh, but yeah, I liked him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So what are some projects you're working on? What can fans be looking forward to? Um, Without giving the names away mm -hmm. because everybody likes to announce their own stuff. I'll say that I've got a poster for a play that's coming out. That's all I can say about that. Okay. I've got um, a, a a thing about horror show hosts that I'm doing that'll be used for a DVD book cover poster and also to for some historical stuff too. There's that. Oh, let's let's check this list here. Oh boy. Um, I've got a, a more Blu-ray covers that I'm doing stuff on and. I'm doing a music CD for a guy. That's a little different for me. I've never done a done a done anybody's musical album before. That's kind of fun. Part of it's uh, uh, a little bit inspired by the kind of women that you see from Joseph Linsner, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. The guy goes, "I want a Joseph Linsner type girl." I said, "Okay, you got it." <laughs> so, uh, and the, but on the back is like a, a cartoon thing that's more akin to the old I uh, the Fleischer cartoons of the 1930s, like Betty Boop and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And, uh, and other stuff too going on is I've got portraits. I'm doing people like uh, uh, four people. I've got star Trek portraits. I've got space 1999 stuff that I'm doing and, uh, war of the worlds, the George Powell war of the worlds. I'm just, just stuff, just a grocery list over here. You're a busy man. It's amazing to me. Sometimes, you know, it, uh, it it's like the old thing of the, you're on the sailing ship and you're worried the day that you're going to sail off the edge which for me would be no work it just doesn't happen it just it keeps coming in from all different directions so i'm i'm very happy about that well it's a testament to your art and the uh the time and effort that you put into each piece well i appreciate it i do i i love i love what i do and i take it very serious and if i ever feel myself starting to slip like no, Mark, you're not. And I say this, you're not going to just phone this in. You're not doing it. You're going to back away from it for a little bit, regroup and come back. And even if it's, uh, you know, for a subject that I don't necessarily care as much about as others, those are sometimes the ones that I, that I work the hardest to make sure that somebody goes, oh, he phoned it in. I'd hate to have somebody tell me that. And we are back. Such a nice guy. I mean, if you haven't seen Mark's art, please do yourself a favor mark maddox art uh google it take a look at yourself um his stuff for the universal monsters his stuff for the 1950s horror films and and even done things for the thing the kurt russell thing um so many pieces of art and his covers for the cold check comics i'm late to the game with the cold check uh i i watched a few episodes growing up but i started watching it again recently and it's such a good show and 
his art blends so well with it. So Mark, thank you so much for taking the time to talk. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and we will see you next week. Mm -hmm.